Welcome to Running on Ice, the coolest community in freight. I'm your host, Mary O'Connell, bringing you the latest tech updates, warehouse news, and everything happening in the cold chain world. Not only is there the coolest show in freight, but there's also Running on Ice, the newsletter that could not be colder. You can subscribe to that on freightwaves.com slash running on ice. Today, we are joined by Dana Krug, Senior Vice President of Cold Chain Fulfillment at, Le- at Phenonic. Welcome to the show, Dana. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, so I've been in Phenonic for about five and a half, six years now. Um, And before that, I spent about 20 years in automated retail, telecommunications, technology, four different startup companies. So kind of a, a, my world is kind of disruptive companies, disruptive technology, um, and kind of bringing things to a a brand new market that's never been done before. So, so Phenotic fits in really well with that because it's a very disruptive technology. Um, when I started with the company, um, I was brought in to, to basically bring up a new division, which was food and beverage. Um, and, um, what's kind of interesting about it is, is we've launched some products in the food and beverage category, um, with some pretty big, uh, international players. And during that kind of that process that we we're going through and, and meeting with customers, uh, I just happened to be meeting with one very, very large international customer. And um, I kept on hearing the same problem over and over and over again. And it all had to do with cold chain. So at the time, we really weren't in cold chain. Uh, it was more about, you know, point of sale refrigeration and freezing and things like that. Um, but, but, over time, I started to realize, you know what, our technology and the attributes of our technology and the core um, benefits of our technology really fit in with solving a cold chain problem that that these retailers had. Um, so about two, three years into being with the company, I actually switched over um, and started the, another new division within the company, uh, which was cold chain fulfillment. So um, just, you know, it's that constant evolution of really looking at what the problems are out there and then trying to apply technologies to make sure that there's a really good fit. So that's a little bit of the background and kind of where I, where I've been and, and, uh, and kind of the changes since I've been in the company. So basically you've always been the problem solver guy. You came and say, you know what? I think we have a solution for this. I'm always looking at it. Uh, I won't say I'm always the guy that gets it, but, uh, but I'm always thinking from that perspective, what's the solution? Um, and is there a good fit? Uh, sometimes there's not a good fit and you have to k- keep moving on. But in this case, um, you, you just, the perfect marriage, right? The stars aligned and it just seemed to be a really good um, opportunity for the company. Well, I'm really excited to get into it because this is something that um, when I first read about it, I came across a press release and I was like, hold on, this thing is really cool. And that's your ACT 2000. Can you break down a little bit about what that product is and kind of how it works? Yeah. 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 So what I brought props. So if you can kind of get, <laughs> so what this is, um, this is what we call a phenotic heat pump or a PHP. So this is the technology that's behind, um, just about everything we do, at least on the cold chain side, uh, and even in food and beverage in health and life sciences, it really comes down to this heat pump. Um, and inside of this heat pump, um, is basically, uh, the ability uh, to kind of increase our capacity for cooling by uh, by building and wrapping the uh, the the heat pump around it um, that gives us the ability to go from say watts of cooling to thousands of watts of cooling to multiple thousands of watts of cooling. Um, but the basic technology, the principle behind this, really, Mary, is um, the ability to to put a electrical current through this, these different types of metals. And what's happening is, is it's, as you do that, it pulls heat away from one side. And when you pull heat away, you're left with cold. So, um, 
if I if we if we could actually demo this to you, normally I'll throw I'll hook a battery up to this, just a nine volt battery. I'll have you hold it. Um, I'll pretend to shock you. You'll pull away. Um, but but you'll feel very very quickly. Um, you'll feel the one side getting really really cold, almost to a point of frost, and then the other side will get will get warm, and that's kind of the the core of our technology. Um, and the, as you can kind of see, this is a very small device. This would be the equivalent of your compressor um, in a, a refrigeration system. So uh, if you look at it, this is solid state cooling. Um, so I can drop it. I don't have to worry about it. It's not a very fragile product like you would have in some thermoelectrics. Um, and as a matter of fact, in this specific heat pump, you could run over it with a truck. We've done it. Um, and it works great. So when you start looking at that from a from a uh, technology perspective, you start to realize that this is portable, it's rugged, um, it's sustainable because we only use CO2 and water for the refrigerator. So um, with that, uh, as you can imagine, CO2 and water, our global warming potential is less than one. So if you look at the industry standard, they're trying to get to an average of say 700. So uh, factors lower um, and that's that's good news for the environment. Anytime a product says rugged on there, it's like I have to see all the tests that you guys have put it through because I like from like kicking it off a roof, running it over with a car, I just want to like be in those rooms where you're like, what else can we do to test it? And it's like, oh, well, I got a truck outside. You want me to run it over? Um, those are some of like the favorite things of like that people have done to test products. I mean, it's important to get tested, but also it just, it cracks me up that it's like, oh yeah, we did it off of like, we threw it off the roof just to see what would happen. But, and it's, and it's been tested. We do a lot of acceleration testing on the, all of our devices to make sure what the failure rate is, how long they will last. Um, and you're looking at some of this, uh, technology or 20 years plus before you have to worry about failures. So yeah, yeah, we do a lot of ruggedized testing. Pr probably not too many people taking a cooler and running over it with a truck, but hey, it, it, it looks good. <laughs> um, so this is the technology that's behind it, right? Um, we take this technology, we kind of wrap a subsystem around it for that's closed um, versus uh, a compressor-based system where you, you're actually compressing gases. This technology, uh, the way that it ends up ends up working is we're wrapping piping around this to pull the heat away and pull the cooling uh, and use utilize that cooling, but it's a closed loop system. So like your compressor based systems that you have today, you have to recharge them. They leak, um, they're leaking it out into the atmosphere with this technology. Um, it's a complete closed loop raised tubing that never leaks. It's charged at the factory. You never recharge it. As a matter of fact, you can have a, you or I, if you can turn a screw, you can work on this product. You do not need to be certified to be able to work on this product. That's how, how good this product is and how easy it is to, to service. So, so that's, the, that's the basis, right? Um, and what that give, really gives us is the ability to have a very small space. So if you think about the tote, the ACT 2000 that we're looking at or talking about, um, interior capacity is everything right so if I, I can take you know you could take a tote with a with a compressor and you put a nice size compressor in there would be the equivalent and your interior space goes away so you've kind of defeated the purpose of being able to do a cooler um, with this technology we're using just on the short side of the tote we're using about an inch of that area for that full cooling system so that ability to have a very small, lightweight, uh, rugged, uh, it gives us the ability to get maximum capacity on the tote and keep the tote as light as possible. Uh, as a matter of fact, our first tote to our second tote, we actually trimmed out about a third of the weight because uh, that was one of, the, one of the areas that the customers really wanted was to have the ability to trim that out. Um, and we increased the capacity inside by a third. So um, you don't normally get that uh, ability to get both um, benefits out of that, but but we're we were able to do that. Our engineers are incredibly intelligent. Um, and then in in the tote itself, you have the ability. It's used for picking. It's used for storage of orders. 
And one of the things that we saw in this last uh, revision of the tote uh, in the, the second generation is the ability to give, give some flexibility when you're picking, right? So think about as you're going down the aisles, you've been in the stores where they're picking uh, into, the, into the ambient totes. Um, we have the ability in our lid to open it from one side or open it from the other side or pull the lid directly off. So you really got three hinges uh, or three different ways of opening the tote. And that comes down to efficiency and labor savings, uh, ease of handling. Uh, so that's one of the other things that we see as big benefit uh, with the tote. Um, and you you start to get into more, and, and if you want to talk through that a little bit more, but we'll talk about applications and why the tote really uh, really is the, the solution for a lot of these cold chain problems. Well, I think that brings up a pretty good point because especially when you say that, so half the battle is you can have all these great cooling technologies. You can have everything that keeps it cold, but also if that weight of that of that equipment to keep things cold is too high, then suddenly you've kind of lost the added value because you know, you're trying to put it on a truck or you're trying to load it somewhere and it's going to end up being heavier after you put that product in. So I, I really like the fact that you guys were able to cut the weight by a third and in kind of increase the space that the usable space that you could end up using. Um, but I guess when it comes to it, like, I guess, what are some of the most practical applications for it? Because I feel like the opportunities are basically like endless. It, yeah. And you're actually touching on probably one of the biggest challenges we have, Mary, which is you, you start to realize the possibilities are endless. So you got to start someplace, right? You got you got to focus on a couple of areas and, and kind of get those off the ground first. So our, our kind of three-prong approach right now that we see the biggest benefit, right? One is in uh, either automated or manual MFCs, so micro-fulfillment centers. I think you've seen a lot of uh, um, uh, press out there on uh, kind of pop-up uh, centers where they might be 10,000, uh, 20,000 square feet, and it's a consolidation point for filling uh, e-commerce orders for the grocers. So you might have 10 stores or five stores that are kind of pooling all of their uh, sourcing or in, in order power, if you will, uh, into one location. So you can start to say, okay, now it makes sense to automate uh, the process when you're picking. So the companies that we work with, and we work with uh, really eight out of the top 10 automation companies that are out there. And uh, the main purpose really is, you know, one is speed to market. And the reason why it's speed to market is because you don't have to build refrigeration rooms. You don't have to build re uh, freezer rooms. Um, you have the flexibility with our tote to not have walls separating each one of your temperature zones. Um, your space constraint actually shrinks down uh, in, that, in that environment. And then what you're also able to do is start putting more of the SKUs actually into the automation system. So if, if you can imagine, you know, the whole purpose of a micro fulfillment center with automation is to automate everything. But the problem that you run into is that because of the temperature zones, you start to say, okay, I'm not going to put this into the automation system or I'm not going to put that. And your orders pick per hour start to drop um, drastically. So our technology enables basically the ability for the, the micro fulfillment center to get as much as possible into the automation and speed up that pick time, decrease the labor uh, in the process. Um, and then what's nice about it is, is that the tote itself can be used not just in automation, but now if you're gonna bring it to the store, if that's where your distribution point is, it's mobile. I don't have to pull the order out uh, and then put it into a different um, type of a carrying case and then bring it to the store or put it on a reefer truck or a refrigerated truck, I can actually just keep it in the tote, never touch it twice, and bring it to the store for distribution or to a different distribution point. So micro fulfillment center is absolutely uh, a big area for us. Um, you're starting to see manual micro fulfillment centers, still kind of that pooling of orders, uh, where we're able to, to cut space in some applications uh, by almost four times. Uh, so we're seeing space savings, we're seeing energy savings, uh, we're seeing certainly the sustainability there, we're seeing labor, um, and the ROI uh, is just fantastic 
uh, coming out of these locations. And then really the last two is one is just in the store. So all of these are like subsected segments, right? So in the store, which is probably the most that everybody in, uh, in the world sees is all of this picking that's happening uh, as they're going up and down the aisles. Um, we give the ability um, in different applications, either to one pick directly into the tote. So if you can imagine your groceries are going into a cold tote, they're being kept at the perfect temperature in our tote and our totes will actually keep them plus or minus a half a degree um, and then it's going to the back room to be staged before you come out and then it rolls out to your car in the tote so you have the assurance that your product uh, in all of the eggs and milk and ice cream and ice cream is truly frozen the, the milk is kept at the perfect temperature right um, so you have that that traceability and trackability all the way through. And that's, that, that's a pretty big impact for the consumer as well. Um, and then the final and the last mile, right. Um, which is the hardest one to crack. Um, especially when you're trying to do it in a sustainable way. Um, so we have been doing testing with, uh, elect electric vehicles. Um, so electric vans. And what we're seeing is, is that we can, uh, negligibly uh, reduce the, the range of a van, right? And that's probably the biggest problem that they have today is you got to worry about when you get in electric vehicles, that range uh, starts to drop very, very quickly. So the, the small amount of power that we pull with these totes and then what I would call on-demand cooling, which is the ability to turn the tote off after each order. So if you can imagine, you've got 10 orders that have to go out. By the time I'm at that last order, I'm pulling no power from the van versus today's environment with compressor base and reaper trucks. It doesn't matter if it's full or if it's empty. It doesn't even matter if you're sitting in a parking lot, that reaper truck is running. So you're burning diesel fuel, um, you're burning energy, and you're you're emitting carbon, carbon emissions into the atmosphere. So our, our tote really works well in all facets of that from an MFC all the way out to the consumer. Um, how out of curiosity, so you mentioned that one of the things that you can do like in a grocery store is you can pick the items and then it goes in the back and waits for someone to do pickup, kind of like, you know, the Walmart curbs, curbside pickup. Um, how long does like it stay like that? Because, you know, sometimes you can wait a day or two before you go pick something up. How long does it like keep that temperature at that exact point um, before you need to start being concerned or maybe plug it into recharge itself or um, but basically like what does that longevity look like? Yeah. So so first, uh, the you, you're spot on as far as people not picking up. So you'll see roughly five percent of the orders don't get picked up. Uh, which is kind of incredible that 5% of the people just don't pick up their orders. Um, but 7% will not be picked up on time, right? So the the problem that you typically will have is in a, I'll call, call it passive cooling environment. Um, if an order is not picked up within a time window, then you have to put the order back into a refrigeration system. So your staging of that order has to be pulled out of staging to be able to do that. So our totes actually, the way that they work, they don't actually don't have a battery, Mary. It's, um, uh, there is a small battery on there, but it's for communications. Um, but the, the tote, when it's on power, it's actively cooling. But if we pull it off power, um, you've got an hour to two hours, um, depending on the environment that you're in, where it will hold the food um, at the safe temperatures. So... Uh, when you're staging these types of orders, what we're seeing like in the uh, uh, an MFC or even in the back room, when 5% of those orders don't get picked up, um, we just leave them right in the staging area and they're kept at the perfect temperature. If it's two days, that's fine. Three, four, five, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, until that order is canceled out, it's kept in the tote at the perfect temperature so you don't have to worry about the food spoilers or food safety or even quite honestly quality of the food um, because it's there are certain items that they may not go bad but the quality diminishes so this is this gives you the ability to have a perfect quality um, on top of the the food safety um, I'm struggling to find a, uh, a fault that this thing does not solve um, because not only is it you know reducing contaminants that can get into my food it's 
you know, keeping it at a set temperature and it can do it for a long time. So I don't have to necessarily worry about it. I'm kind of saying this and also the, uh, the, your guys's version of a compressor, I forget the name that you gave it, but, um, it, you know, lasts for many, 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 many years. I'm really struggling to see where it's not the problem, the, the answer to all the, all of my problems. Well, I mean, this is like anything. Not it's it's not going to be the answer to all your problems, but it's certainly from a cold chain fulfillment perspective, it 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 checks a lot of the boxes that are out there. Um, you know, and and when you're talking about some of the benefits um, to our technology and to the specific solution, um, you know, we have the ability to actually monitor every tote. I kind of told you that the battery that's there is used for communications. So we actually monitor the totes. So there's actually about 130 uh, points that we actually monitor on the tote. So that could be fan speed, that could be reject heat, it could be the outside temperature, could be, is the lid open? Um, is the fan slowing down? So what that gives us is a lot of things to, to help. Um, one is predictive maintenance. So if we were to have a tote fail, um, then we would know in advance and we would actually probably notify the retailer before it actually happens. So your downtime is minimized um, versus what you might see with a, a refrigeration system. Uh, I, I remember just uh, about three months ago, we put a pretty large system in. The second day after we put it in and it was for a pilot, um, their refrigeration system went down. So they had pulled everything out of the refrigerators. The point being, that's a single point of failure. Your refrigeration system goes down, all of your orders are affected. If one tote goes down, you have one piece of one order that's going to be affected. So it's 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 nice to see that. And then we have the ability to actually document the temperature that's in the tote um, down to the actual order and actually the items that, are, that were placed into the tote. So from a traceability perspective, um, you have all that documentation too. So I'm just kind of proving your point probably that this seems to fit everything <laughs> that you need. Um, you know, but th I, I will tell you there's one area that I would concede on. Um, and that is if you're starting to put uh, really, really large items um, into the tote, then that's probably not us, right? Uh, if you're going to put a, a side of beef in there, it's not going to fit in our tote. Um, but I would tell you that we've done some testing with some customers, actually pretty large customers with bulk items, and we're still getting 99% of their SKUs that fit inside the tote, uh, which is pretty amazing, especially for more of a bulk uh, uh, type customer. That's amazing. I, I'm very impressed with that. Um, but that being said, we are running out of time, which it means you're probably going to get asked the hardest question you've been asked all day today. Everyone that comes on the show has to answer it. So, Dana, are you ready? I'm ready. Is cereal considered a soup? Cereal considered a soup. All right, so let me think about this. Uh, it's not cooked, but there are some cold soups, so I guess it could still fall in that category. Um, I'll say no, and here's why. So cereal can also be used as a treat, right? You can just eat it by itself. I don't know of any soups that you could actually just take the ingredients and eat them. Um, <laughs> and you actually have to mix the, uh, well, maybe you could. It'd be kind of messy, but uh, um, you actually have to mix the milk in um, at that point. Um, so I, I'm going to go, no, it's not a soup. That's the answer that we love to hear. We love to hear. Um, I'm very happy about that. But if someone wants to reach out about maybe their cereal is soup opinions, or if they need um, help with cold storage, where can they find you outside of the show? Yeah. So if you go to our website, uh, fanatic.com, uh, you will have a plethora of information regarding this. Uh, we would love to to talk with anybody about any of these types of issues they, they may be having in, in cold chain fulfillment. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, we talked a lot about grocery today, but it doesn't necessarily have to be grocery. It's, it's anything in the cold chain that needs to be kept at a specific temperature. That could be cosmetics, that could be pharmaceuticals, uh, that could be chocolate, uh, things that still need to be kept at a specific temperature. It's, it doesn't matter what's in the tote. Uh, it's more about keeping it uh, at the right temperature for the length of time that you need to. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate it. You can catch other episodes of Running on Ice right here on YouTube or anywhere else you get your podcasts like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Need more run on, Running on Ice news? No sweat. Subscribe to the newsletter on FreightWaves.com slash Running on Ice. See you on the internet. Thank you.